that much. <laughs> the Subcommittee on Legislative and Budget Process of the Committee on Rules will come to order, and I want to begin by thanking our witnesses who we'll hear from uh, in just a few moments, and thank each of you for being here today for your uh, participation. I'd like to thank my colleagues on the Rules Committee for joining me as well, the Chairman of the Standing Committee on Rules, uh, the Honorable Mr. McGovern, who I'm uh, really grateful to for helping to organize this and for being here this morning, and my friend and colleague, the ranking member of the uh, subcommittee, uh, Mr. Burgess, and uh, we're delighted to, uh, to have you all here. Um, our nation is uh, reeling from recent series of senseless mass shootings in Buffalo, Uvalde, Tulsa, and too many neighborhoods across the country. Uh, as we all know, these tragedies have become far too common. There have been more than 200 mass shootings already in 2022, which is more shootings than there have been days of the year. And our nation is experiencing an undeniable surge in gun violence across the board. More than 45,000 people were killed by guns in 2020, which is an increase of 15% from the previous year. And according to a recent analysis published in the New England Journal of Medicine, firearm deaths have now replaced motor vehicle accidents as the leading cause of death for children in this country which I'll admit is uh, a, a fact I continue to repeat and continue to have a hard time uh, even processing. Uh, my community of Rochester, New York, had a record-setting year of homicides in 2021 and sadly is on track potentially for another uh, year like that in 2022. So June is Gun Violence Awareness Month, um, but as I often say, we are already painfully, brutally aware what we need now is, uh, is action. So today's hearing will focus on actions that Congress uh, can consider to better combat gun trafficking and ensure that illegal guns do not make their way onto the streets of our communities. Uh, and those actions include ensuring that ATF has the necessary tools and resources to track and police gun trafficking, as well as critical funding streams for gun violence prevention uh, research. Gun trafficking defined as the diversion of firearms from the legal market into the hands of those who cannot legally possess them uh, is a major contributor to gun violence Americans are experiencing each day. So many of the guns that show up at a crime scene originated as a legal sale from a licensed dealer. According to every town, and we appreciate uh, every town being here for gun safety, analysis of ATF data, almost 1.3 million guns were used in a crime and traceable by law enforcement from 2016 to 2020. Of those 1.3 million guns, nearly 40% were used in a crime within three years. Uh, raising the prospect that the gun was likely purchased uh, with the intent to be used in a crime uh, at the time of sale, and 72% of those guns came from a state without background checks. So many of these guns are diverted to the illegal market through straw purchase, which, where an individual uh, legally purchases a firearm for someone who is prohibited from legally possessing a firearm themselves. Gun trafficking can also undermine comprehensive gun laws at the state level, as guns often move from state to state uh, and move from states with weaker gun laws into states with stronger ones. In a report issued by the New York State Attorney General found that 74% of guns used as crimes in New York State between 2010 and 15 were originally purchased legally out of state. 
The other message of diversion include gun theft and irresponsible conduct by some uh, federally, uh, fire, uh, federal firearm licensees uh, or gun dealers. According to recent data from ATF, around 18,700 firearms are reported lost or stolen from gun dealers each year. Many of those firearms later trace to violent crime. Despite this, law enforcement is limited in what they can do to curb the flow of stolen firearms onto the streets. So federal law requires right now pharmacies to lock their controlled substances away at night. Seems reasonable. Yet federally licensed gun dealers are not required to take basic precautions to protect their stock. Um, the result is that thousands of guns are not properly secured, and many dealers are repeatedly burglarized without experiencing really any consequences for failing to, in, to uh, secure dangerous weapons. So uh, I uh, have worked with others and am proud to sponsor the Gun Theft Prevention Act, H.R. 4423, which would take a number of steps to increase oversight of gun dealers and grant ATF the tools to hold repeat offenders accountable. Um, although ATF's goal is to inspect each license holder at least once every three years, a recent report indicated that ATF only inspects each gun shop once every seven years, making it virtually impossible to ensure that dealers are maintaining compliance with even the most basic and, in my view, limited requirements. So my legislation would require ATF to inspect all gun dealers every three years and give them the resources needed to do that. The Gun Theft Prevention Act would also require ATF to perform annual inspections of high-risk dealers. And we've heard pushback from the industry that claims that high-risk dealers uh, and the claims about them are overblown uh, and that dealers selling a high volume of firearms will inevitably be responsible for more uh, guns that are involved in crimes. However, the data clearly states otherwise. In a report issued by ATF, the agency found that 1.2 percent of gun dealers were responsible for over 50 percent of crime guns later found on the street. I'll say that again. 1.2 percent of dealers responsible for over 50 percent of guns found on the streets in the commission of crimes. 87 percent of gun dealers were found to have no violations at all. So it's imperative that we grant ATF the resources they need to properly target bad actors and hold them accountable despite attempts from the industry to, to spin this effort as unnecessary. Uh, it's also important to note that the problem is getting worse. Between 2013 and 17, the number of firearms stolen in gun dealer burglaries more than doubled, and the number of firearms stolen in gun dealer robberies tripled. So I look forward to hearing uh, from your testimony on the importance of adequately funding gun violence prevention research. Despite the staggering number uh, numbers on gun violence, um, which I mentioned previously, there are restrictions on data collection uh, and research allowed to be performed by CDC or the National Institute of Health, and I'm sure Dr. Lee has some comments to make about that. Uh, the Dickey Amendment, which is in an appropriations rider first passed in 1996, expressly prohibited such federal investments for more than two decades. And although Congress began funding $12.5 million each for the CDC and NIH annually in 2019, much more is needed after years of neglect on this issue. So I look forward to today's discussion. Uh, appreciate uh, the chance to give us uh, some opening marks and hopefully give context for this. And I hope uh, we will engage in a constructive dialogue, which will lead to uh, actionable steps that we can take to better combat gun trafficking and protect our communities from the epidemic of uh, gun violence. And with that, let me now turn to my uh, a friend and colleague uh, on the Rules Committee and the ranking member of this subcommittee, uh, Dr. Burgess, for any remarks he wishes to make, sir. So thank you, Chairman Morelli. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing today. Thanks to our witnesses for being here and helping us deal with the issues of trafficking and criminal violence in our communities. I especially want to welcome Mr. Bill Napier, who possesses years of experience as a security analyst, a firearms compliance consultant, and a law enforcement officer. Mr. Napier helped launch Operation Secure Store to prevent the theft of firearms. Recent shootings in your state and my state underscore the need to keep firearms out of the hands of dangerous individuals and to prevent their theft and to remove illegal firearms from commerce. So certainly I look forward, Mr. Napier, to hearing more about Operation Secure Store and any efforts that we, at the federal level, can undertake to keep America safe. Now, yesterday, back home in the Dallas Morning News, uh, it was reported that the Department of Justice, in conjunction with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, uh, the Dallas Field Division announced the indictment of a man who purchased over 90 guns illegally and then resold them. Many of these guns were used in crimes, including homicide, aggravated assault, and drug trafficking. 
The person was also charged with making false statements during the purchase of a firearm. Unfortunately, according to a Department of Justice Inspector General report from 2018, only 1% of individuals who lie on their background forms, Form 4473, ever are prosecuted. Even worse, ATF does not recover all the firearms illegally in commerce as a result of these illegitimate purchases. So, not related to today's hearing, but previously I introduced a bill, H.R. 194, to require the Department of Justice to again study and report to Congress on this issue so we can be better prepared to help protect Americans and recover illegal firearms. And Mr. Morelli's legislation, which is included in this hearing, H.R. 4423, the Gun Theft Prevention Act, seeks to prevent gun thefts from stores and federal firearms licensees. We must find a way that we can work with our lawful sellers to prevent thefts and gun trafficking. Just as an interesting side note of the story reported in the Dallas Morning News yesterday, uh, the individual who illegally purchased and then diverted the many firearms, the actual point at which the firearms were purchased lost the license, but otherwise received no special scrutiny or, or prosecution. Um, perhaps we can hear a little bit more about that from Mr. Napier or any of our other witnesses this morning. This hearing is also about just reducing violence in our communities, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a successful program that occurred in the district that I represent, the 26th District of Texas, to do just that. I live in one of the most rapidly growing parts of the country. It's an area just north of the DFW airport. Um, a lot of people are moving there. Every year in the month of April, I do an emergency preparedness summit. My staff refers to it as the tornado summit. We have a lot of people moving to the area. We live down at the tip of Tornado Alley. Um, and while we don't have the majority of the tornadoes that will occur, of those tornadoes that do occur, we are the most densely populated area and we are growing rapidly. So many people move to our area who really don't understand some of the, some of the peculiarities of, of Texas weather. So I do this summit every year. This year in, in April, and it was uh, right at the end of April that, that we did the summit, I also invited the chief of the Argyle Independent School District Police Department to talk to us about school safety because he has a rather unique program that, uh, that he has instituted in the, in the school district, relatively large school district in the suburban area of, of Denton County. Um, I met him several years ago uh, after one of these events occurred, and I'll just never forget his comments to me. He and the superintendent decided they were not going to go to 20 funerals in Argyle, Texas. So he put together this program, and we can talk about it in a little bit more detail. It's not really part of the, of the hearing that we have here today, but part of it does include arming personnel on a voluntary basis and the proper training, and I know that can be controversial in other parts of the country, but it seems to be working where, where Chief Kearney had set it up. But he also had a card that he gave to every teacher. It's sort of like one of those life alert buttons. Any teacher can shut the school down. Ask questions later, something that makes you uncomfortable. Maybe it's a shooting at a funeral home across the street after a car accident. Shut the school down, then figure out what to do next. And Chief Kearney reported that there had been a time or two where things got shut down, where maybe that uh, when they unwound everything, maybe it wasn't necessary, but he'd far rather face that than what might be the alternative. But uh, I do hope we can talk about those types of programs in a, in a broader context, but I thought it would be useful to at least bring it up today. The many of these problems do have local solutions. Drew Ferguson, a member from Georgia, and I have worked on uh, legislation called the Big Act, passed the House now twice, still awaiting activity over in the Senate. Uh, big Act stands for Behavioral Interventional Guidelines. So often we hear that yeah, everybody knew this kid was trouble, but no one knew what to do about it. No one knew who to go talk to. So trying to provide some framework where 
educators and administrative staff and, and teachers will have the be armed with the necessary tools for the proper type of behavioral intervention when it's when it's required. Um, regardless, reducing the trafficking in illegal firearms will limit the ability for dangerous individuals to pose a threat to schools, houses of worship, or retail stores. Uh, we wish we could be better preparing our campuses, our school staff, and our local law enforcement to prevent and respond to these situations because that's an important piece of the puzzle. But again, look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. Thanks to all of you for being here, and I'll yield back to the chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bridges, very much. I'd like to now take a moment to introduce our witnesses. Uh, first, uh, Mr. Rob Wilcox is the federal legal director at Every Town for Gun Safety. He is a nationally recognized expert on gun safety, drawing upon more than 20 years of policy, advocacy, and litigation experience. Mr. Wilcox specializes in the development of comprehensive approaches to address gun violence and technical advice on the development of evidence-informed policy solutions. Uh, following uh, Mr. Wilcox, Sheriff Scott Baxter has joined us as the Sheriff, Associate Sheriff of Monroe County. My home Greece Police Department. Sheriff Baxter joined the local force following three years of active duty with the United States Army as a military police officer. We're also joined by Dr. Lois Lee, who is a senior associate in pediatrics in the Division of Emergency Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital and associate professor of pediatrics and emergency medicine at Harvard Medical School. She focuses her work on pediatric emergency medicine, injuries, health disparities, and health policy. Dr. Lee has published research on injury prevention including injury related to firearms. With this expertise, she serves co as chair-elect of the AAP's Council on Injury Violence and Poison Prevention. Uh, finally, we're joined by Mr. Bill Napier, who has more than 30 years of experience in retail loss prevention, serving in leadership roles such as site security manager, corporate manager, and director. For more than 18 years, uh, Mr. Napier has also been in the retail outdoor arena with responsibility for ATF compliance and firearms-related security and investigations. Additionally, he has spent 20 years in municipal law enforcement. He's currently involved with the Loss Prevention Research Council at the University of Florida as a member of the Violence Crime Working Group and sits on the board of directors for the Loss Prevention Foundation. Again, an august group, and we're delighted that each of you took time out of your schedules to be with us. And uh, we'll begin with uh, Mr. Wilcox and ask you to try to limit your comments. Uh, we have your written testimony, which is in the record, uh, to about five minutes, and then we'll ask our panelists for uh, questions. Uh, good morning, Chairman Morelli, uh, Ranking Member Burgess, uh, Chair McGovern, and uh, distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Rob Wilcox, and I am the federal legal director at Everytown for Gun Safety, the country's largest gun violence prevention organization. I'm a survivor of gun violence whose cousin was shot and killed by someone who never should have had a gun. I come from a family that's had guns as long as I can remember. But I'm also an attorney who's worked on gun policy for nearly 20 years in a number of different capacities at the local, state, and federal level. I'm exceptionally grateful for this opportunity, this important hearing, to discuss America's gun violence crisis and the flow of illegal guns and what we can be doing about it. The mass shootings in Buffalo and Uvalde devastated, terrified, and motivated action like we've never seen before. But make no mistake, every single day in this country, 110 people are shot and killed and hundreds more are wounded. We've been horrified to our core more times than we can count with places of joy in everyday life becoming places of terror. And we're not moving in the right direction right now. Cities across the country are seeing record gun rates of gun violence, homicides increasing 30% from 2019 to 2020. And more and more, the guns recovered at crime scenes bear the signals that they were purchased from dealers for the purpose of gun trafficking or use in crime. And there's deep disproportionality in who's being affected by gun violence, with black Americans 10 times more likely than white Americans to suffer from gun violence. The epidemic also comes at a true cost to our country. Individual families like mine are left devastated by the costs of losing a loved one, and local resources are strained to pay for it. At every town, we estimate that the cost comes to $280 billion a year. That's more than the budget of the Veterans Administration. And as we've been talking about today so far, addressing gun violence requires a comprehensive approach that balances community-based programs that we know are effective at reducing violence with upstream solutions to keep illegal guns out of our communities in the first place. 
ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms that we mentioned, has made clear the three most common pathways that illegal guns take. No background check sales, straw purchases, and gun thefts. We know when it comes to background check sales, there are too many commercial marketplaces where individuals who want to traffic or can't own guns can get them without a check. Just one website, just one alone, there was one million ads per year for no background check sales. And we know that that is a place that traffickers will go. President Biden's new gun trafficking strike force just announced a bust of one gun trafficking ring that acquired 500 guns from online sources to traffic from Georgia to California. Straw purchases, another significant area for inquiry. Straw purchasers often show signs. They show an unfamiliarity with the firearm that they're trying to purchase, they pay in all cash, or sometimes the actual buyer will come with them as well. Gun dealers can be trained to identify this, Technology can be, can be used to make sure that we actually keep an eye on what's happening so we can bring criminal cases. And we need a standalone crime for straw purchasing and gun trafficking on the books in federal law. Lastly is gun theft. Hundreds of thousands of guns are stolen from homes each year. Guns are frequently stolen from cars, a trend that's rising. But we also know that guns are stolen from licensed gun dealers, who, as the chairman mentioned, are not subject to minimum physical security requirements under the law. ATF reports that over a recent five-year period, 80,000 guns were stolen or lost from federal firearms licensees. But the truth is that number doesn't tell us the full story. In just one smash and grab in Wisconsin, one gun was used in 27 shootings in Chicago. So there's a deep ripple effect when these guns are stolen or lost from gun stores and they end up being used in crimes. But just as we can identify these issues, we can identify the solutions as well. No one solution will stop all of gun violence, but we can take a comprehensive approach. We can have background checks on all gun sales so there's no commercial marketplace where strangers can go to acquire guns. People selling dozens of guns each year should be treated like the gun dealers they are, rather than individuals that are flooding our communities with no background check sales. We know Congress must, can pass modernization and provide ATF more resources. Congresswoman Kelly's Federal Firearms Licensing Act is a great example. And as you mentioned, Chairman, we need security being required, because it's not enough for optional efforts when the cost is so high. We need required efforts, and so we strongly support the Gun Theft Prevention Act as a critical and necessary step. These are simple solutions that will dramatically reduce gun violence over time. We know the cost is too high. We know it's too high in dollars. We know it's too high to our communities, and I know it's too high for what my family's experienced. With concrete action, we can make a difference and save lives. I look forward to this discussion and your questions, and thank you so much for having us. Thank you. The challenge before this body is to effect meaningful change to reduce victimization without sampling on rights of individuals. I'm proposing two guiding principles for future legislation that can considerably reduce the plague of illegal firearms. They are responsible commercial firearms management and positive gun ownership. With nearly 400 million legal privately owned firearms in the United States, one tenth of one percent of those firearms are stolen or lost annually. That's 400,000 firearms reported lost or stolen. 95% of those losses from private owners, 5% from dealers and manufacturers. Responsible commercial firearms management is a necessity. The current legislation with refinements can significantly enhance and promote responsible firearms management by those in business to selling firearms. Presently, there are 82,000 federal firearm licensees in the United States. A vast majority, legitimate, competent small business owners responsibly selling guns. There are an unknown number of individuals with licenses that have acquired this license to validate personal possession of firearms not available to most citizens under federal and state laws. ATF reported in 2020 it conducted 5,823 inspections. At this rate, it will take more than 13 years to inspect every FFL. Let me reiterate that. 13 years to inspect every FFL. More ATF agents, 
available to educate, conduct inspections, promote best practices for physical security gun dealers would reap great benefit in dealing with preventable gun thefts. Giving ATF the discretion to deny or revoke FFLs not involved in commerce, mandating inspections while reducing their limitations all advance the goal of responsible firearms management. In my community, we dealt with a reckless gun shop owner. His inaction to keep accurate inventory combined with the weak physical security of his shop directly contributed to the theft of 133 guns in eight separate burglaries over 13 years. There were three burglaries just in the year of 2018, with the last one accounting for more than 100 guns lost. Because of no accurate inventory, we'll never know exactly how many guns were stolen. If the ATF had the ability to swiftly enforce standards, a significant number of guns would not have made it to the streets and in the hands of dangerous criminals. Requiring licensees to submit security plans and confirm implementation makes perfect sense. ATF has comprehensive and effective guidelines for physical security and safety. Maintaining ATF to work with these licensees to tailor their plan to the conditions on the ground at the individual location rather than a one-size-fits-all approach would greatly yield better results. Requiring increased physical security measures at gun shops, while aspirational, will also create financial hardship on some small businesses. I would strongly urge the development of a loan or grant program through the SBA to incentivize and improve physical security of license holders. Paramount to the success of enforcement and reducing stolen and lost firearms is the timely and complete reporting of all relevant information. A number of differing and non-existent state requirements currently hinder the efforts to track and report lost and stolen firearms. The real challenge before Congress is to figure out how to achieve maximum participation by law enforcement using law enforcement sensitive tools that are already in existence. In addition, having the best information is critical to effective decision making. We in law enforcement rely heavily on the FBI's open source Uniform Crime Reporting Program, the UCR, in decision making, policy development, and commitment of resources. Expanding the UCR to include general and stolen lost gun data would be helpful in policy development and research. A second proposed theme for this future legislation focuses on gun owners. Since the vast majority of guns are stolen by ind from individual owners, the federal government could be most effective by promoting positive gun ownership. In our lifetime, we've seen the results of government-led efforts to reduce drunk driving, smoking, and other initiatives, and through far-reaching educational and public service communication. The fact of a campaign to educate owners on the dangers of the community by their stolen firearms is an effective, effective tool to reduce thefts. Also, the federal government can support funding for training opportunities that would include safety, safe storage, legal issues pertaining to gun ownership. These positive educational tools will go a long way to diffuse the vilification of the more than 75 million legal gun owners in our nation. If we are willing to eliminate the us versus them mentality, that is so prevalent today and work on common ground at a starting, as a starting point, we will reduce the supply of stolen guns that are going into the criminal element. We want to incentivize responsible gun ownership, not criminalize gun owners. Incentivize, not criminalize. As Monroe County Sheriff, I have to remark on the courageous and professional work of law enforcement, in particular in my community, that is working hard every day to rid our community of illegal firearms. Successful prosecution and incarceration of those responsible for stealing firearms is as important as stopping the theft itself. Partnering with our federal law enforcement partners in a multi-agency task force model has shown viability and success in achieving this goal. Our community is second only to New York City in recovering crime guns in recent years. A recommitment to enhance funding of federal, state, and local partnerships is a great investment. Thank you again for this opportunity, and I do look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Sheriff. Uh, before I call on Dr. Lee, just a reminder, uh, this is a reminder I need more than probably anyone, to hit the talk button in front of you so that the microphone is, uh, is activated. Dr. Lee. I didn't say it would be easy. I think I got it. Uh, Chairman Morelli, Ranking Member Burgess, and distinguished members of the House Rules Subcommittee on Legislative and Budget Process, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I'm a pediatric emergency medicine physician at Boston Children's Hospital. 
and I have seen firsthand the devastating effects the death of a child has on their family and community. I've also seen the debilitating consequences of when a bullet goes through a child's spinal cord and causes lifelong paralysis and pain. I've also seen the lifelong mental health consequences of post-traumatic stress disorder and depression, not only for the victims of firearm violence, but also for their family, friends, and community who have been witnesses to firearm violence. These are wounds which literally never heal. I know that you know firearm injuries and deaths are a serious public health problem that affect too many Americans. And now you also know that firearms are the number one cause of death in children and youth in the United States. In 2020 alone, there were 10,197 deaths from firearms for children and youth zero to 24 years old. This averages to 28 children killed by firearms every day. Or in other words, one school bus full of children die because of guns every two days. As gun violence is a public health problem, we know a multi-pronged public health approach is warranted to prevent these deaths. And this includes implementation of policies to reduce product-related dangers, and also promoting the manufacture and appropriate use of safer products. As these strategies have been successfully, successfully uh, decreased motor vehicle crash injuries and death, perhaps we should look to the motor vehicle safety system for approaches for gun violence prevention as well. Motor vehicle safety has a system designed for continuous improvement to decrease injuries and deaths on our roads. Part of this is the safety agency, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA. And we also have motor vehicle and insurance industry incentives for designing safer cars. We don't have any of these for firearms. Thankfully, we do have the ATF, but this is a law enforcement agency, not a safety agency. And we do have technology for safer guns right now in the form of personalized smart guns, but Americans cannot buy this on the US consumer market right now. Smart guns use technology, just like the biometric fingerprint on your cell phone, to make sure only the authorized user can fire that gun. And that pre prevents suicidal or homicidal teenagers and adults from firing a gun either to shoot themselves or shoot someone else. So for firearm injury prevention, as you know, there are many strategies we should consider. But these are three measures I would like to begin to recommend. Number one, increase funding for gun violence prevention research. Number two, enact universal background check laws. And number three, enact comprehensive extreme risk protection order or red flag laws. Not only are these actions important for a public health approach to decreasing farm related injuries and deaths, but they also have support in Congress and among the majority of Americans. We need increased research funding for gun violence. The research community does appreciate the $25 million appropriated by Congress since 2019. With this funding, the CDC has funded 18 projects, including on how to decrease suicide risk among US Army soldiers and veterans, how to reduce urban firearm violence, and also how to teach children about firearm safety. But this is far from adequate. For example, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute of the NIH has an annual budget of 3.8 billion, much more than 25 million. In addition to research, stronger federal and state level policies are essential. Universal background checks supported by nearly 90% of Americans would make communities safer by ensuring those at risk for gun violence can't purchase guns. We also need comprehensive red flag laws to keep guns out of the hands of those at risk for suicide, and homicide, especially in situations of domestic violence and mass shootings. In summary, I'm here today in strong support of these three actions to promote firearm injury prevention in the United States, especially to keep our children and youth safe. And I know this is a goal that we all share. Given the magnitude and growing problem of gun violence in the United States, we cannot, we must not be paralyzed by the politics of firearms. Although the recent Senate agreement is progress we know it is not enough. We must make public health and safety of our children and youth and our society at large a pri priority. We should not become a country where we believe gun violence is inevitable, much less acceptable, especially when there are decisive actions that you and Congress can take to prevent mass shootings, firearm suicides, and the daily firearm violence impacting children and communities across our country. These are things you can do as our leaders and policymakers. As a pediatrician, policy researcher, and a parent, 
I urge you to take these actions to decrease gun violence in our country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Now I'd like to uh, call on our uh, final uh, witness to testify, Mr. Napier. Chairman Morelli and Ranking Member Burgess and the other distinguished members of the Is your talk button, just to make sure? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is that better? Great. Well, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and to provide input and detail my experiences and efforts to combat the thefts of firearms from federally licensed firearm retailers, or FFLs as we call them. My name is Bill Napier, and I have more than two decades of experience as a security analyst and an ATF compliance consultant. I have conducted several hundred compliance visits at licensed manufacturers, distributors, facilities, and gun dealers of all sizes and shapes. I've also pre presented at dozens of conferences, seminars, and webinars to educate those in the industry on the panoply of regulations they must comply with as a condition of their license. And lastly, I have over 20 years experience as a law enforcement officer. I want to be very clear, the industry takes security very seriously, which is why in 2018 we launched Operation Secure Store, which is a joint effort of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms that aims to prevent the theft of firearms from federal retail licensees, or FFLs. I'm extremely proud of the work that we have done in cooperation with the ATF to make a difference, and we feel it is making a difference. Operation Secure Store promotes public safety by proactively educating FFLs in identifying, quantifying vulnerabilities, and risks that are associated with the business of firearm commerce and industry-related operations as a whole. Specifically, Operation Secure Store has five components, education and awareness, then assessment and risk analysis, planning and strategy, engagement, and finally, response. These are outlined on the Operation Secure Store website. In the education and awareness portion, we educate firearm dealers to ensure they have an ongoing awareness of potential threats, an understanding of the security basics, and access to the techniques and solutions that can be effective in protecting their businesses. We partner with the ATF to develop educational programming, including our current and ongoing series of regional security seminars hosted by the ATF. The assessment risk analysis is the initial step in identifying the vulnerabilities and weaknesses that could cause the FFL to be more susceptible to criminal threat or other hazards that could compromise their daily operations. Security and risk assessments, a service provided by the Industries Trade Association, seeks to evaluate credible threats, capabilities, identify vulnerabilities, test their current controls, and assess consequences of a breach. Upon the assessment's completion, gaps in existing controls may be identified and remedies suggested to ensure those areas in need of improvement can be addressed. Additionally, through these assessments, the FFLs are afforded the skills and knowledge to conduct ongoing self-assessments that include assessing the potential risk, prioritizing how and when those risks need to be addressed. Once the assessment and analysis is over, we develop a plan and a strategy. The details when, where, how an FFL will develop or modify its security processes or programs as supported by the knowledge gained through the assessment and risk analysis. Material always with the goal of mitigating risk, deterring potential threats. Strategies will include recommendation. The last two components of Operation Secure Store are often overlooked. Community engagement can have a tremendous impact on crime and crime prevention strategies. Active participation and relationship building with local law enforcement and the business community and the community citizens can be critical to protecting a business. And engaging all these helps build a beneficial level of trust between the FFL and the community. Both the industry and the ATF have established protocols for providing outreach and support to FFLs and their communities. And lastly is the response. 
An FFL's ability to respond quickly and efficiently to a crime against its business is critical not only to identifying the perpetrators of the crime, but the recovery of the stolen goods, but to a speedy reestablishment of their daily business operation. ATF and NSSF are both committed to providing timely support to the FFL when a criminal or other emergency event occurs. NSSF and the ATF will often provide matching rewards to information leading to the arrest of those responsible for the crime. It is important to detail this approach to illustrate the way we educate, analyze, assess, plan and strategize and respond in a personalized way unique to each, each FFL because no two are the same. So the work has to be tailored to fit that specific situation. One size fits all is punitive, unfunded, mandate is ineffective. As an example, let's say we were to mandate that all FFLs retain video recordings for say one year. The, FL, the cost of the FFL would be prohibitive. Uh, let me give you an example. So the ramification of this one size fits all. So there's 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, 168 hours in a week. That's 87, 60 hours in a year. That would need to be recorded somewhere, held in video evidence. So one terabyte of um, high definition video will hold about 500 hours. So you need one terabyte every three days. That's about 121 terabytes a year. That doesn't include the equipment cost of the server, the switches, the software, the racks, the heating and cooling of the room, the labor to manage all this. And then statistically, far fewer firearms are lost or stolen from FFLs than they are from private citizens, law enforcement agencies, and the military. While we appreciate the attention of the issue of thefts of firearms from FFLs, we, as we too take it seriously, Congress should also consider paying the same level of attention to the military and law enforcement. And there are several other recommendations I believe will be more productive uh, approach or the use of the OSS or Operation Secure Store program as a basis for inspection, certification. Include all sources of consolidated firearms in the bill to include common carriers, the firearms could be taken there, the rail service, private security groups, they have large groups with lots of firearms, law enforcement and the military. Funding for the FFL to acquire and manage the security equipment is gonna be essential. Requiring reporting of missing firearms lost in 48 hours for everyone. Um, give FFLs access to the NCIC computer records the FBI keeps. When they acquire a used firearm, they have no way of knowing if the firearm is stolen unless the local law enforcement helps them. So if I am a firearm dealer, I would need access to the records to say, before I acquire this firearm, I need to make sure it's not stolen. Also publish the number of lost or stole stolen that are reported by persons, private security, law enforcement, and military, as well as the firearms recovered at crime scenes from each of these sources. Lastly, how many firearms are used in crimes or recovered from crime scenes from all sources? I think, um, again, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to discuss the important work we do on behalf of the industry, law enforcement, and the American people I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Hey, thank you to, uh, to all of you for your testimony and for being here. I think uh, by uh, conversation Mr. Burgess and I, or Dr. Burgess and I had earlier, I'm gonna ask uh, just a couple questions at the outset and turn it to him and then I'd like to make sure my colleagues who I'm sure have busy schedules and other places to be, I wanna make sure that they have an opportunity to ask some questions and then uh, we'll come back uh, here to uh, Dr. Burgess and I. But let me just start. Um, Mr. Wilcox, uh, for you, we talked a, a fair amount about ATF uh, and the limitations in terms of its funding. Can you just describe um, the impact that the lack of resources has on their ability to fulfill their mission, particularly as it relates to, to gun traffic and how we could address that? Uh, thanks for the question, Chairman. So, I mean, ATF received the lowest amount of federal funding uh, of the four largest federal law enforcement agencies. So, compared it to FBI, DA, DA, U.S. Marshal Services over the last four years. Um, and even with surging crime rates, that funding has remained relatively flat. Um, even when the prior administration requested a 20% increase of funding, 
we saw just a kind of minimal increase. And so we know that we need to put funds in ATF so they can build out their regulatory capacity, they can build out their data analytics capacity, and they can make sure, as uh, the sheriff said, they have enough inspectors to actually go out and inspect the FFLs uh, so that we actually can make sure that the good are doing better and that those who are rogue and not following the laws can be shut down. And it's essential that we separate the two classes, is that we do know that there are hardworking Americans, some of whom I know, that run FFLs, and they are looking to do the best they can to keep their firearms out of the wrong hands by looking for straw purchasers, by keeping their store safe. But the truth is, we can't just rely on optional programs when the cost is so high. We can't rely on the option of whether or not a store will put in place security measures when we know that that's gonna save lives and stop a smash and grab that could happen eight times over 13 years, I think, as the sheriff testified. And so it's really important that we both put the resources in ATF to address these specific issues, as well as pass those laws. Thank you. Uh, I wonder, uh, Sheriff Baxter, you mentioned the, um, the challenges that, that law enforcement faces in keeping track of guns that are in the community. And given the technology that we have, clearly in this day and age, you know, how do you respond to people who suggest that it's too difficult or onerous to keep track of where these guns are. Do you, you have any observations on that? Yeah, thank you for the question, Chairman. The, uh, the fact is that I can uh, go online right now and check my Amazon package and find out exactly where it is in shipment. Uh, but I cannot answer a simple question in Monroe County of a gun that was just recovered, was it stolen? Was it stolen in Georgia? Was it reported lost in South Carolina? Uh, was it reported stolen next door? Uh, the comprehensive database that we're looking for, a simplistic comprehensive database, is something that we're lacking, seriously lacking in, in Monroe County. Uh, those 130-some guns stolen from our local gun store, again, there's no inventory prior. There was no inventory checks and balances ahead of time. So, again, even knowing what guns were stolen from that store is, is not trackable right now. Uh, so all we're looking for is a simple tool to track firearms uh, from the purchase on through. If they're stolen, report that to so law enforcement and other agencies that would use this information comprehensively. Uh, and then on the other side, when, when we do have someone with a stolen firearm, right now it's very difficult to charge someone with criminal possession of a stolen property charge uh, because there's no supporting deposition. We don't even know if the weapon's stolen. Uh, and that's a charge we'd like to put on someone. They're stealing property and possessing it, including a dangerous instrument. Uh, so those are some things just in that tracking mechanism and, and, and the, uh, if you will, the database that we're looking for, that comprehensive database that would allow us to do all those functions and give us good research. You know, there's a lot of data. We heard a lot of data today. And, uh, but there's no holistic, you know, one-stop shop for, for this data that we're looking for. Uh, very good. Thank you. I'm going to turn to Dr. Burgess to uh, ask a couple questions, and I want to make sure our other uh, colleagues have the opportunity as well. Thank you, Chair Morelli. Uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, an article that I encountered on my local paper, the paper, the Dallas Morning News, uh, I'd ask Nam's consent that we can include that in the record. So, Mr. Napier, in talking about this article in, in the Dallas Morning News, uh, there's a man who was indicted for illegally purchasing over 90 firearms for the purpose of resale. He purchased 75 guns in six months from a seller who, uh, although they, the seller themselves are not under criminal charge right now, they did lose their FFL license. So as a, a practical matter, what happens to the inventory of that store after that FFL holder loses their license because of this activity? In some cases, they would sell their inventory to another FFL. Is, is that a requirement? Well, here, let me ask you the hard question. Okay. Do we think that the ATF is going to follow through on that and make certain that this dispersal of inventory follows appropriate uh, uh, channels. I would hope on their inspection, if they went out, that they would find that and deal with it. Yeah, I would too. I mean, it just points up what could be, uh, what, what could be a, a, a deficiency. So if a, if a, a gun store, if an FFL holder is, is under investigation, um, then what happens if they go out of business during before the investigation is concluded, and, and again, the disposition of the inventory, what, what's going to happen there, same thing? Well, I understand that the ATF has the ability to do an emergency uh, hearing and take the license and possibly seize the firearms at that point if they think they're a, an immediate threat to public safety. 
Otherwise, the firearms could be sold then if the FFL knew that they were terminating their FFL was imminent. Okay, Ms. Morley, I'll, I'll reserve other questions uh, for later and let you proceed. Terrific. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, I'll call on uh, Chairman McGovern if you have any questions, sir. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Mr. Morelli for doing this hearing. I support his legislation. I want to thank you all for, for testifying. Um, Dr. Lee, I agree with all of the recommendations that you outlined uh, that, that uh, Congress should do, um, and I think the majority of American people do, uh, as well as I think would agree with what's, what we're talking about here today. Um, but, uh, you know, welcome to Washington, uh, where because of the arcane rules in the Senate, uh, there's a dictatorship of the minority. Um, so it doesn't matter what a majority of senators even want. Um, uh, all that matters is you need 60 votes to get a cup of coffee. Um, and, uh, and we'll see what comes as a result of the, the uh, bipartisan negotiations. I don't think it will be anywhere near enough, but I, I hope that it will uh, at least be a step um, in the right direction. You know, um, you know, we're talking about you know gun stores and, and illegal sales. Let me, let me, I mean, um, you know, a few years back, Congress indemnified gun manufacturers to a certain extent. And I guess my, my question is, if you're a gun manufacturer and somebody steals a bunch of guns from you, uh, is is are you legally obligated to um, to report that? I, I, anybody, I, don't, they, I mean, and if they don't, what is the consequence? So you, the law does, uh, thank you for the question, Chairman. The law does require you to legally report that a certain time period any discovered lost or stolen firearms. Um, and there's a penalty for not reporting, but there's also no uh, inventory check to make sure that you're regularly looking for lost or stolen firearms. And the law that you pointed out has had dramatically bad consequences. Right. I actually was involved in the litigation of a case at a gun store in Alaska where an individual wearing a garbage bag walked in, was looking at guns. The gun dealer says he left him alone with the gun to go heat up a burrito. This guy walked out of the store with the gun, there was cash left on the counter, and a young man's life was killed just a few blocks, taken a few blocks away. And there was a litigation by that young man's family to hold that dealer responsible, saying, you had no security. You, you left this man with a gun who was wearing a garbage bag, and you just walked out your door. And the court said that that immunity law that you spoke of protected that dealer. Yeah, so like, like what sense does that make, right? Um, you know, we had a gun manufacturer in, in my home city of, of Worcester, Massachusetts, where, um, you know, they didn't, the, they did not do adequate background checks on the security guards. Uh, they were involved in helping uh, facilitate guns leaving the, uh, the, the, the manufacturer. Um, never was reported. Um, a gun, one of those guns was used in a shooting that killed a, a young person. And uh, again, to the best of my knowledge, there was no consequence other than some a bad article uh, for the manufacturer, and I, I guess you know, the, you know, the, you know, some of the stuff that's used to be trafficked, you know, um, is obtained through carelessness and through um, you know lack of responsibility of manufacturers. Not all, but some. And so when we're talking about how we tighten things up so that it's accountability, so that you know. What the inventories are, and, and and you could, if you get a database, you could then go and you could actually check that this was a stolen gun from this. It, it, it's like we we have made it, we have made it uh, easy for people not to do the responsible thing, and um, and I, I again I I'm, I'm some of the stuff that we have done over the years here just makes no sense to me. If if the issue is about protecting our children, but not just children, everybody. Um, you know, I've, um, you know, so many people are being killed in gun violence in this country, you know, that I worry that they become statistics. You know, it, it, the number is so enormous that people can't even, I think they've lost their human ability to feel what that means. Now, the, 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 the terrible tragedy in Uvalde and in Buffalo recently, um, I think where attention was 
given to the individuals who were killed, it humanizes this, and people all of a sudden, we're, you know, we're talking about this again. Uh, but every day an individual gets killed. Not just, we have massacres on a regular basis, but every day an individual gets killed, and no one knows their stories. No one, no one knows you know, the grief that their parents are going through or their children are going through. Um, and, um, but I, I, I think part of this discussion has to be on the responsibility of people who are producing, um, not just selling, but actually manufacturing these guns, um, you know, to, to, to help us try to control what has become an epidemic uh, in this country. And, um, you know, I, uh, you know I'm, a, I'm a congressman, but I'm a parent first. And I, got, I, I you know, my kids now are, are 24 and 20. I still worry about them when they go to the movies. Uh, you know, um, I still wor I worry about them when they're, you know, when I when just graduated from college, when my daughter goes to school. You just don't know, um, and I and I and, and I, I used to say, I have two sisters who are school teachers, and what they t tell me is, you know, the solution, from their point of view, is, don't give me a gun. I mean, one is, uh, you know, I'm a teacher. Um, I don't feel comfortable having a gun in my classroom. Um, I do not want to be faced with the choice of having to use a, a gun against a student. Um, and by the way, someone who walks into my school, you know, with an AR-15 or somebody who has body armor on, you know, really? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be able to figure all this out. Um, you know, I um, and, and if we're going to if we're going to turn our schools into kind of armed fortresses, well, what about our supermarkets? What about our churches? What about our synagogues? I mean, it, it, there's no end to all of this, um, and uh, but I, I, I appreciate all that you do. I mean, in law enforcement, in uh, the medical arena, uh, in advocacy, and you know, help trying to bring all this stuff uh, under control. And again, I hope that we get something uh, out of these discussions. I hope we can move Mr. Morelli's bill. I think I, again, I, I, it's one of these things like, like who could be who's opposed to this, right? Uh, I'm sure somebody will be, uh, and uh, but uh, I, I I think we all agree. You know, we 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 have to start doing some stuff to get things passed, and we ask, we also have to look at some of the laws that are on the books that uh, uh, make all this very difficult. Let me just say one final thing. Uh, you know, I uh, I have a a new well. I've always appreciated our law enforcement officials, but, you know, I, I, I have, you know, I've talked to a lot of people in my, in, in uh, my community, in the police department, the sheriff's department, you know, they have no idea what they're walking into. Um, is, and, you know, I'm sure if your people are trained, you're armed, you, they, they can handle a weapon, but, but you, you have no idea what you're walking into. Um, and uh, because there is such a, a proliferation of these weapons uh, in this country, and uh, you know, and I, uh, and so I, I appreciate uh, y your service as well. So I, but anyway, th I, I'm I'm on a rant. So let me just let me end here and just say I thank you for coming, and I thank Mr. Morelli for putting this hearing together. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to. Uh, uh, call on uh, Ms. Scanlon from Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for organizing this hearing and the legislation you've introduced. Um, during the past couple weeks, as we've seen March for Our Lives rallies around the country and gun violence vigils everywhere, um, I've heard from hundreds of constituents who've decided that enough is enough, and they're demanding action. And what has really impressed me and struck me is that these are young and old, male and female, Republican, Democrat, independent, black and white, uh, responsible gun owners, and people who have never owned a weapon in their lives. It's everywhere. So, and I think it's because at this point, no one is immune from daily firearm violence in our country. Um, whether 
It's affecting parents who are afraid to send their children to school because of the gun violence on the streets between home and school or because of what they're seeing on TV when there's a mass shooting. Um, whether it's families where a member of the family, whether a veteran or increasingly and so tragically children are struggling with mental health issues or the random intrusion of gun violence that is making people question their ability to go to the church or the temple or the synagogue um, or the grocery store, movie theaters. I was held up at gunpoint in a public park. Another relative just yesterday had a drive-by shooting in their suburban neighborhood. So um, we're all questioning our safety in the face of what is just a public health epidemic at this point. So whether or not members of Congress and particularly the Senate are willing to act, I think the American people understand that we can't sit idly by and watch preventable deaths by gun happen every day. Um, if we're going to stem the tide of violence, we have to have a range of approaches because the problem is so large. There's no one magic solution. Um, so whether it's universal background checks, red flag laws, um, banning ghost guns, et cetera, and addressing the underlying challenges that are causing people to pick up guns in the first place, um, whether it's mental health struggles, poverty, lack of education or opportunity, this feels like an all-hands-on-deck moment where we need to do a lot of very different things. Um, as local officials in my district are working to reach solutions, one thing I hear over and over again, state, federal, local, is um, that we need to stem the flow of guns to our streets and to people who we all agree should not have them, whether it's um, felons, criminals, people who are in active danger to themselves or to others. So it feels like a very big piece of the solution is to make sure that laws and protections already on the books are already are actively being enforced. One way to do that is to make sure that the ATF has the resources and leadership to do so. So we're really urging the Senate to act and make sure we confirm a director of ATF since they haven't had a permanent director since 2015. Um, but talking about the ATF, recent ATF data indicates that gun sales soared during the pandemic and for thousands of guns sold in 2020, the time to crime was six months or less, and that's a big change. A recent report from Brady confirms what has been reported in the past, that a small number of gun shops in Pennsylvania supply most of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's crime guns. So we know they come, crime guns come from multiple sources, but if a really good tool is to cut off the supply of illegal guns. It could be for federally licensed firearm dealers to do a better job to prevent guns from being acquired by straw purchasers and traffickers, and for the ATF to be able to adequately enforce those laws on the books and shut down gun dealers who are skirting the law. So, Mr. Wilcox, uh, can you talk about why a small number of dealers usually account for a ma majority of gun crimes, whether in Pennsylvania or elsewhere? I think because there's common understanding of where a gun trafficker or straw purchaser can go because that store owner is likely to look the other direction. And not only do we have the statistics you mentioned, Congresswoman, but there was recent information that was released by the Oversight Committee after getting new data. And, and I know that there's always conversation of, well, maybe you're just selling a lot of guns and it's just a small percentage of your inventory. Well, one of the leading crime gun suppliers in this country, store in Georgia, 10% of their sales were guns that were traced to crime. 10% of all of their sales were crime guns. And that, that's, that's shocking. And if you can't take real steps to call that a high-risk dealer and make sure that they're following best practices and they are video recording that store, because I really would like to know what's happening in that store, that 10% of those guns are being traced to crime. And, and I get that there maybe there's some data limitations and we want to make some excuses, but the truth is that is a shocking number. And I think if I was a straw purchaser, gun trafficker, and I knew a store, 10% of his inventory was crime guns, well, that's the store I would go to, no doubt about it. And, and so I think we have to give ATF the tools it needs. We have to modernize our laws to take into account how guns are trafficked today in 2022, so we're not living in 1986, and really give them the resources and leadership, as you said, they need. But the truth is, I think a lot of us in this room can agree on that, but colleagues in the House of Representatives of yours have introduced a bill that wants to eliminate the ATF. So it's not all good-natured. We have 
folks who think that we shouldn't even have this agency. And, and so I really think that is the difference right now between the two approaches of we need to shut down bad actors or we should just eliminate this very valuable agency. So I would characterize it as people who want to actually solve the problem and people who don't. Um, <laughs> but turning to, there's been a sharp decline in um, ATF federal firearm license compliance inspections in 2022 and continuing into 2021 and 20, I'm sorry, sharp decline in 2020, continuing to 2021 and 22. Can you talk about ATF's decline in inspections in recent years, the implications of what does this limited number of inspections mean for revocations, you know, the ability to enforce um, the protections that are supposed to be there for all of us? Uh, absolutely, Congresswoman. So, you know, ATF is not doing many inspections as it is, inspecting around roughly 10% of active FFLs a year. And it would take over 10 years to actually inspect every gun dealer there is. But the truth is, these inspections don't always turn up clean records. Nearly half of them will show some violation, many of them very serious violations. But we see very few revocations, less than 1% of FFLs are revoked, even when we see very serious violations. And, and truthfully, in 2020, what we saw is the lowest number of inspections that we've seen in years. Mm -hmm. And I think that is just incredibly problematic that we have high-risk dealers, like I've mentioned, we have very few inspections, and then we, don't, we aren't seeing concrete action. I'm heartened by the president's intention to take on rogue gun dealers and have a zero-tolerance policy, but we really need to, to do that seriously by expanding the number of inspections we're doing. Thank you. So one thing we can do is provide more resources to expand inspections. Are there other things Congress can do to hold gun dealers accountable when they break the law? Yeah, I, th I think the chairman's bill is a great example of requiring gun dealers when they apply for their license to submit a security plan. Mm -hmm. And then they have to be held to it. And if they don't, they can be held accountable. And I think the chairman's proposal is really smart because depending on if they were negligent or they were just made a mistake, there's different penalties. You can go from a small civil fine to a license revocation, depending on your culpability. And I think those are tools ATF doesn't have right now. Right now they have your license is revoked or it isn't. And we have to give them those tools that when they see infractions, they can have civil penalties, license suspension. They can require a dealer to potentially do more. Because right now it's just an all or nothing bet. And that just isn't working. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate this input. That's really helpful. Um, as I close out, can I just seek unanimous consent to introduce a report from April 2022 by Brady United Against Gun Violence entitled Uncovering the Truth About Pennsylvania Crime Guns? And I yield back. Without objection. Thank you uh, to the distinguished uh, colleague uh, from Pennsylvania. I, uh, by WebEx, we've been joined by another uh, distinguished member of the Rules Committee and of the subcommittee, uh, Deborah Ross of North Carolina. Uh, Ms. Ross, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the witnesses, I apologize for not being there, but we're trying to um, deal with a gun bill in judiciary at the same time, and Ms. Scanlon and I are uh, both monitoring that gun bill as well. It's the number one bill that's been requested by law enforcement, so um, Sheriff Baxter, it's the active shooter uh, bill, and um, hopefully we will get it out of judiciary at some point and to the House floor. Um, last week, our committee held a hearing on two common sense gun bills that keep our fellow Americans safe while respecting their Second Amendment rights. And today's meeting um, under the leadership of, of Chairman Morelli is just as important as we explore actions Congress can take to better combat gun trafficking, to ensure that illegal guns do not make their way onto the streets of our community. I represent North Carolina, a Southern state with plenty of law abiding gun owners, but hundreds of my constituents have reached out to my office over the past few weeks, begging for us to take action to keep our fellow Americans safe from gun violence. And this is on both sides of the aisle. And we have a number of unaffiliated voters who are tremendously concerned as well. So it's imperative that we work together to combat this public health crisis. Thanks to the ATF, recent data tells us that three states are the destination for 45% of all trafficked guns in the South. And North Carolina, 
is one of those three states. Almost 25% of the guns traced by the ATF in North Carolina originated from outside of the state. And unfortunately, of the top 10 origin states for trafficked guns in North Carolina, eight had no background check laws. My state requires a background check to purchase an unlicensed handgun. But the precise information I shared with you is due in part to the ATF's dedicated work to make data available in the hopes of making our communities safer. Allowing the ATF to publicly release illegal gun tracing data helps us tackle gun trafficking and instills hope rather than fear in our citizens. Um, I wanted to ask first, um, Sheriff Baxter, how do you work with the ATF and is there anything the ATF could do to um, be even more helpful to law enforcement? Thank you for that question. Uh, absolutely. First of all, we have a wonderful working relationship in Monroe County with all our federal partners, uh, in particular the ATF. Uh, we recently uh, approved a position at the Sheriff's Office to join the ATF task force to work on that uh, proverbial iron pipeline. Uh, that is transporting weapons to, to New York State, in particular my community. Uh, and also uh, to do inspections, you know, to, to work with our, our, our educational portion of this with our federal firearms licensees and, and our dealers that are selling guns up there legitimately. And uh, my feedback yesterday from two gun dealers, uh, gun shops in Monroe County, was that uh, they have a great relationship with the ATF. They come in, they're helpful, they're inspecting, but they're really concerned about the rogue if you will, the outlier that, that, that uh, as I explained just earlier, you know, released 133 guns at a minimum into Monroe County. Uh, so that relationship is, is, is very strong, at least up in our way. Uh, the one thing that we're, we're really lacking, I heard it a couple times, is, is this data, right? But it's got to be timely data. Uh, you know, we have the rogue store, that's, that's, that's apparent. Uh, but if we got these straw purchases come from one particular store in, say, South Carolina, I'll use that as an example. Uh, you know, we could put ATF agents and Monroe County Sheriff's deputies on the airplane to go down and investigate that if we had that timely information of these weapons being transported. So that's something we're looking for, a little more teeth in that system, a little more capability in the, in the data collection. And then one more point is, is our store in Monroe County, the example I'm using, uh, they had no teeth to shut it down. We begged the ATF. We begged our town code enforcement officers. Uh, we tried every tool we had. Uh, so it also has to have the power, the authority, if you will, to temporarily shut down and seize, if you will, uh, the inventory if we have that one outlier and, and then hold the judicial process as soon as possible to make sure their due process is in play. But uh, that's one of the things we're, we're seriously lacking is that ability to stop something that's hemorrhaging right in front of us uh, as quick as possible and then go through the due process to see what's really occurring. Thank you very much. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Lee. And, um, you know, we've been, I, I am a huge proponent of red flag laws. Um, as you know, the House passed a red flag law um, last week. And um, I think that this, they would go a long way to preventing, um, you know, imminent threats. But I am somewhat concerned that there is, um, a, if not a belief, but maybe talking points out there, that the that people all people who commit gun violence um, have mental health issues, and while I believe many do, um, I also think that implying that people who have mental health issues would always be violent um, does a disservice to people with mental health issues. Um, my dad's a psychiatrist, um, and um, he. Get, this is a bugaboo for him as well. Could you talk a little bit about um, the difference between how a red flag law would work and, um, and, and then how people who maybe don't have mental health issues um, maybe have anger issues or other issues that, um, that society needs to find a way to, to combat um, through mental health or, or other ways? Um, and I'm sorry if that's a little bit of a jumbled question, but um, it's been something that's been bothering me about our discussions and our debate about who commits gun violence. 
Thank you, um, Representative Ross, for that question. I agree with you 100% that addressing mental health alone does not actually directly address this problem of gun violence. And the truth is most people who are diagnosed with a mental health disorder are not at risk for being a perpetrator of gun violence. They're actually at a higher risk for being a victim of gun violence. And uh, many of those who we think might be at risk for uh, either um, suicide or for homicide are not diagnosed with a mental health problem. So that is not in and of itself a good way to screen um, and prevent gun violence. But the way extreme risk protection orders would work is that someone would then petition a court to temporarily, and it depends on the state, temporarily um, prevent an individual from either purchasing or possessing a gun if they're at risk either for harming themselves or harming someone else. And so if there's a concern for domestic violence, um, also known as intimate partner violence, or some other concern for assault, then you could petition a judge to, again, temporarily remove the firearm, um, the ability to purchase or possess a firearm. Uh, in the case of mental health, if there was an individual, a teenager or an older adult, and um, for those who may be less familiar, for adults, actually 60% of gun deaths are suicide, uh, not homicide. Um, so if someone makes statements, even though they may not be diagnosed with depression, uh, either on social media or to a friend or to a counselor, again, then the courts can be petitioned to temporarily remove the firearm from that person's possession or ability to uh, purchase. For suicide, that's particularly important because suicide is often a very impulsive act. And if someone um, decides in the moment that they want to kill themselves with a gun, greater than 90% of the time, they will be successful in killing themselves. But what we also know is that the majority of people who have survived a suicide attempt actually never attempt suicide again. And so this is why means matter. Uh, people who try to commit suicide by ingesting medications in an overdose, for example, greater than 90% of them survive. And that's because they have time for regret, they have time to tell somebody, or they develop symptoms and they can go to the hospital and then they can get both the medical and psychiatric help that they need. And so making uh, it more difficult for somebody who might be suicidal or homicidal, or even potentially making threats for a mass shooting, uh, being able to prevent the means access to a gun uh, would be very important as just one part of sort of decreasing the gun violence epidemic. Thank you for that. Um, I do have one more question for you since you raised the issue of domestic violence. And um, we've seen amendments and statements that um, victims of domestic violence, um, we should encourage them to get guns or um, have guns be given to them, maybe even from somebody who thinks they could be protected um, in, the, in that situation. Um, I've worked on some domestic violence issues as a state legislator. And um, the, what I've learned from the domestic violence community is that um, taking that approach frequently ends up with the perpetrator of domestic violence um, finding the gun and using the gun. Do you have any information about that? Or, and if you don't, does anybody else um, on the panel have any information about um, guns and domestic violence? I can speak briefly on that issue, both basically in older studies that have shown that if there are guns in the home, more likely somebody uh, in the home will be shot and killed by that firearm. Uh, and typically, in the case of domestic violence, it's the perpetrator of domestic violence who will um, you know, kill the victim of domestic violence, as opposed to uh, being able to actually protect uh, a stranger from coming into your home. So we just know having the presence of a gun in the home not only increases the risk of homicide, often from domestic violence, um, or from suicide, just because, again, access, of the access. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if anybody else on the panel has anything to add. Um, if they do, great. And if not, I can yield back. I'd be honored to uh, add a few bits of information on that. You know, the, the, the tool is one thing, and the red flag laws are, are something that obviously we're, every state is debating right now, and, and New York uh, has one and is trying to bolster theirs as we speak. Uh, but going to domestic violence in particular, but school shootings, targeted violence cases, uh, another important part, you know, for this con Congress to discuss is, is a threat assessment process. 
uh, TAM teams, if you will. We started one about three, year ago, three years ago in Rochester called the Rock Tech Rochester Threat Assessment Committee, uh, Advisory Committee. And what they do is they get together twice a month and look at these potential targeted violence cases, whether it's domestic violence or school shooting, uh, someone that's raised into that level in the community that's, that's different, that, that is really different. Uh, and we're able to present that to 26 participating member agencies to a holistic look at that person and how are they ascending up that ladder towards targeted violence and then intervene with multiple different facets. And like I said, there's 26 organizations that get together. We broke down the barriers. We broke down the egos, the silos. We talked about FERPA. We talked about HIPAA. Got all those legislation and things out of the way. And uh, it's, it's very amazing what we can do when you get those agencies together and look at this potential targeted violence case, whether domestic or not. And we've been extremely successful in intervening in these people's lives and getting them the help they need, uh, but also, you know, uh, making sure that the community is safe at the same time. So we're looking at it from both points. But I just uh, want to put in there that, that, you know, this threat assessment model is something that we really need to replicate. They're doing it right now across New York State, uh, using ours, thank God, as, as a model. But uh, intervening in lives, looking at the see something, say something, and doing something with that information that so many organizations do in silos but don't do comprehensively, I think is really a golden nugget here that we got to discuss. Many thanks, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ross. Um, I'd like to, uh, just if I can, a couple more questions, and I'll, I'll certainly uh, I'll yield also to my uh, friend and colleague. But uh, Dr. Lee, the, you know, there's a lot of conversation about uh, uh, trying to get research to look into the impacts of gun violence. But can you just tell me what might we look like? The average citizen might say, well, we know about the number of uh, gun deaths. We know about the number of shootings. Um, there's a lot that we know about guns, illegal guns, et cetera. But w what do you think we'd be able to gain um, from additional investments in research that you mentioned in your testimony that we don't know now? What, what would help us? What would be of value to us? Thank you, uh, Chairman Morelli, for that question. There's so much that we don't know. And as a gun violence researcher for uh, the last 10 years, it's very complicated. And it's not just a public health medical issue. It's a criminology issue. It's a sociology issue. And so the funding really needs to be cross-cutting. It's wonderful to have the CDC and NIH funding. But we need it over more federal research agencies to really do multi-year, complicated, you know, multidisciplinary research. Some of the areas that we really need to explore as we were talking about red flag laws, what is the best way to write legislation and what are the most effective ways to um, enforce that and how effective are these laws? We have a few studies looking at state by state, but we don't really have the evidence-based science that we can truly get if we had more funding around that. We need to have a better understanding of what are the risk and protective factors for gun violence, both for homicide and for suicide. Uh, we need to better understand what are the associations of the social determinant of health, health inequities, and how that leads to the huge health disparities we see related to gun violence. Uh, and we also- So this, yep. uh, I'm sorry, so just to, so much of this would be aimed at going further upstream, identifying factors that the research shows contributes to potential violence, and then working with not only law enforcement partners, but you, you're suggesting an approach that goes to educational, social, health partners to try to really uh, identify those risks and people who are at risk and do interventions much earlier. Is that, is that, Absolutely. do I have That's that? The whole model of prevention, right? We need to go upstream. So if you want to prevent lung cancer, we've decreased smoking. We want to decrease deaths from motor vehicle crashes. So we have lowered highway speed limits. We have, uh, you know, drunk driving laws. We don't let teenagers drive when they're 14. You know, so there are things we can do upstream to try to decrease those outcomes of injury and death. But then there are also interventions for when they inevitably some will happen. So um, the, you know, the president's investment in hospital and community-based violence intervention programs is also critical. And so with this complicated issue, we need to work upstream and downstream. It's uh, funny, I wasn't planning to mention this, but back in Monroe County, I co-lead an effort that is, um, really aimed at integrating health education and social service delivery. And we're working with our health care systems, working with all of our different partners. Um, it's directed at folks in poverty, but folks in crisis just generally. The idea is classroom teachers have limited information available to them currently, 
don't know how other factors outside the classroom are affecting not only the scholastic achievement, but just the, the appropriate development of children. Uh, the same is true of people who have behavioral health issues, mental health issues, to try to bring caregivers together so that they're working uh, what we call warm handoffs. We're looking at social determinants. We're looking at community schools. And uh, I hadn't really thought about it in that context, but what you're talking about actually would aid efforts like that because it really does allow an intervention so that hopefully people like Sheriff Baxter may know about it but may not have to intervene because we've managed to sort of, you know, uh, not only remove the threat or lessen the threat but really have positive interventions in the lives of individuals who unaddressed would potentially lead to violence. Absolutely. And that's why this multi-pronged approach is really the way to go. The um, Thank you for that. I, I, you know, as, as I was thinking about it, um, talking about in particular the, the bill that, that I referenced, H.R. 4423, does a couple of things around uh, not only <clears throat> inventory. So for gun dealers, actually asking and requiring them to have an inventory of guns, to do a reconciliation uh, periodically, maybe a couple times a year to reconcile what their inventory is. Also for private dealers, um, to make certain that they report within the bill has 30 days, report to law enforcement when there's a theft. So right now, if you're a private dealer, not a, not a, 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 a licensed uh, federal uh, licensee, um, you don't have any requirement to report lost guns. They end up on our streets. I wonder maybe Sheriff Baxter, but others feel free to comment on how this could change that and, and create more accountability. And then the number of different kinds of sanctions we could impose um, more than just sort of the binary, yes, you're okay, or we're going to close you down. So other things that would help ameliorate what is a potentially a dangerous situation. The uh, firearms dealers that I'm familiar with, very reputable firearms dealers, have great inventories. They, you know, what comes in, what goes out, where it went. Uh, they do not mind doing inventories on a, on, a, on a more normal basis and reporting that to the local ATF agent who then could possibly, they're verifying it with a written statement, but it also could be verified other ways by an ATF agent. Uh, that, that, is, that is not something that's difficult to ask for, uh, and it should be done. The other uh, point that you brought up, Congressman, is, is you know, the reporting. Uh, you know, it, it should be the obligation of someone that has a firearms that is lost or stolen to report that to local law enforcement as soon as possible. It may be part of an overall criminal enterprise no one knows about. Uh, it may be threatening to one of my deputies or to another citizen. There may be multiple reasons why that should be reported as soon as possible. And that's how I would write the law, as soon as possible. Uh, that should be reported. And then via us, just like the UCR data that I talked about earlier, report it up the chain to the, uh, to the federal agencies that uh, track it overall, and then can share that data across sectional uh, areas that are you know, involved in this discussion. Uh, but very, very limited uh, resources would be needed to keep that database by a, a reputable gun dealer and then report that more than once a year that they have that inventory on, on hand. And if not, report it stolen or lost as quick as possible, including individual gun owners. I think it's just a, a simple thing that we can ask folks to do. Report to local law enforcement if you can't find your firearm. And I would, and I, I uh, certainly welcome any comments from any other uh, panelists on this. I, I do note that if you really want to get to the small percentage, even of the, of the licensees who seem to be persistent, and you talked about this, Mr. Wilcox, um, that having the data would then allow us really to target in on the high risk uh, problems, whether it's the, the licensees or it's private dealers who continue to have a, uh, a potential for repeat. I mean, that really allows us to focus in ways that without the data, you're just kind of like, you know, searching literally for a needle in a haystack. I don't know if anybody, please feel yeah, free. Chairman, that's one of the problems is that the data has largely been kept from us. Uh, since the early 2000s. Um, I think it's absolutely right that those who want to do good will always try to do better. And those who want to hide in the shadows will look for every opportunity. And right now, because of an appropriations rider, we don't get good data on the source of illegal guns. And are there concentrations in particular places? And are those dealers themselves mul failing multiple inspections? And, and that's the kind of dealer, that's the kind of information and data that can help focus our, our law enforcement so that the sheriff can get on that plane, as he mentioned, and go find the rogue gun dealer and make sure we are putting them out of business. And so I think we all are saying the data is important, but that means we have to actually see it, and we got to put it in the sunlight, and we can't let bad actors 
hide in the shadows. I think there's more that can be done even under the current restriction as we've done with, with public health research. We haven't repealed the Dickey Amendment, but we are doing research. And there's more data we could be publishing now, even with the appropriations rider that I think should be repealed in place. Anybody else? Chairman Morelli, may sure. I make a comment? Yes, Mr. Napier. So uh, I think we need to look at all sources of crime guns, not just the firearm dealers. We've got crime guns that come from police stations. We've got crime guns that come from security agencies. We've got crime guns that come from the military. We've got crime guns that come from personal collections. It's, we need all this data. Wouldn't that be helpful if I were the sheriff to have that information? That Am I dealing with a gun dealer? Am I dealing with another rogue police agency or a rogue uh, rail service? There's bad people among us everywhere. Yeah, I, I, I mean, not to interrupt you, but I'm not sure that anybody would object. I think we would agree. I, I know that I've spoken in my responsibility as a member of the Armed Services Committee. I've talked to... Um, uh, folks in the Department of Defense about uh, guns that go missing off bases, right? So people, maybe when you're discharged, you take your firearm with you. You're not supposed to, as I understand, uh, but it happens. So, but, but I think your point, but the, the more data that's available to all of us, particularly to people like Sheriff Baxter and in, 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 uh, his brothers and sisters in law enforcement, the more that we know, the more data we have on all of those, I think benefits us. I'm not sure anybody objects to it, so I, I would welcome those additions uh, to the bill. And again, I think the vast majority of people are trying to do the right things, private owners um, and dealers, as well as licensees. But there are clearly problems. I mean, we have, you know, when you have 45,000 people dying of, of firearm-related deaths in the, in the United States in a given year, you clearly know there's a challenge. This, I think, and, you know, I'm sure Dr. Burgess and I will have side conversations about this after, but I'm not sure this necessarily impedes on people's views of the Second Amendment. This is really about making sure that we all as a society just know where lethal weapons are. We do it, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, around pharmacies, understandably. Opioid epidemic and, um, and uh, things that are, are on Schedule One uh, under controlled substance, we want to know where they are. They have street value, and they can be lethal as well. Certainly, guns, can, by their very definition, are lethal, um, and so really, Inventory tracking, making people be held, uh, making people be accountable for them, particularly when it's something you do as a matter of commerce, whether you're a licensee or you're just a private dealer who does it periodically. Everyone should be held accountable. I would, I would think. I don't know, if, yeah, Dr. Lee. I just want to make a comment. So again, if you have to buy a car, you have to have a license, you have to have training, you have to have it registered, and you have to have insurance. None of those things, depending on the state you live in, right, you may not need licensing. You are not necessarily going to be registered, and insurance is not involved at all. So, again, a parallel thing. We're not trying to take away people's rights to have their gun. We just want to make sure that they're, they can use it safely. No, I think that's a great point. And I, as the, when I was in my years in the state legislature, I was the chairman of the insurance committee. So I appreciate what you're saying. And we do have that rule. So... We're not inhibiting your ability. Everybody has access to an automobile and a license, but you have to make sure that you're insured so that if something untoward happens, something unexpected, there's ways to protect all the interests, both of, of drivers, passengers, and pedestrians in, in automotive accidents. So, yeah, Sheriff, you look like you wanted to add something to that, sir. I think a, a key component is uh, training, right? We, we provide training classes to our constituents in Monroe County free of charge. As a sheriff's office, a lot of the private entities that are selling firearms do the same thing. And they teach those things I, I alluded to earlier in my testimony uh, about safe storage, safe handling, awareness at how many guns. It's your gun, it's stolen. You should not be a victim of crime, but realize that guns ending up on some street somewhere and possibly hurting someone else. So just be more conscientious. Those things go a long way. And let alone the legal issues around firearms, you should at least be aware of those things. And it's very popular in Monroe County. We don't, we don't tell people that they go. They, they knock down our door to go to those, those training sessions. So it has a long-reaching uh, you know, effect on just educating the public of, of what is going on in our community and how do you store it properly. Yeah, no question. Yeah, Mr. Wilcox. I, mean, I, I just want to kind of emphasize that point of storage. And it really cuts across lethal means and suicide prevention and school safety. I think say something is a, you know, hear something, say something is a great model. We need early intervention. We need wraparound services. But we also know as part of that, and the recommendation is that we control access to lethal means, access to firearms. Three out of four school shooters are getting their guns from the home. 
home of family, friend, or relative. And so that res personal responsibility of secure storage in the home goes a lot way to protect that home, protect from theft, and protect our schools. And so if we really are gonna be comprehensive about our interventions, we need to know what secure storage really works. And the truth is, oftentimes, a lot of what's used is not terribly effective. There are cable locks, including some that have been distributed that have had to be recalled. About half a million cable locks that were distributed had to be recalled because they were ineffective. So we have to really see what is the effective secure storage to stop teens, uh, to stop thieves, so that we can kind of keep guns in the right hands and not let them fall into the wrong hands. Appreciate that very much. Um, I think, uh, and I appreciate all the comments and observations and the testimony. Uh, I think uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Burgess for any additional uh, thoughts you have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in, in addition to the uh, newspaper article I submitted for the record earlier, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to uh, put into the record the slide deck from Chief Paul Kearney that he presented at our Emergency Preparedness Summit in, in April. Um, <clears throat> appropriate to the discussion, his second slide is titled A Multi-Pronged Approach. That's come up several times today. And... Uh, um, Failed to mention when I was detailing his earlier uh, or earlier how he how he structured this. He actually does employ a full time clinical psychologist on the on the campus of the of the school district, and I think that's been extremely effective. And his reference to me was a fairly large school district. He's been there for eight or nine years. Uh, he's only made five arrests over that time, uh, which speaks to the early engagement. Uh, with law enforcement and, and intervention. Um, Without objection. Thank you. Mr. Napier, I, I know we've, we've been here for a while, and I know it's been a long day. I appreciate everyone's input today. You heard me mention at the very beginning of all of this uh, in my opening statement uh, concern I had about the data uh, that Congress receives from ATF, those people that actually lie on their <clears throat> national instant background check uh, that they fill out. The number of prosecutions then that's done by ATF is vanishingly small. So I have introduced a bill to address that. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that approach. I do, sir. That's uh, HR 194. I assume that you're talking about. Uh, we have to enforce and we've got to prosecute the laws that are on the record now. And when we don't, I'll give you an example. So if I'm a federal firearms licensee, I call FBI NICS and get a proceed or else I get a delay or I get a denied. If I get a denied, that person shouldn't have been in my gun store. Every night, the FBI, I understand, does a dump to the ATF. Well, the ATF doesn't have the resources to go out and knock and talk on the door of these people that should not have been in a gun store to begin with. And I'd ask that that get a, a good look. And, perhaps funding, but uh, can you imagine how many on a daily basis are getting dumped down to the ATF and, okay, guys, now go get them? Where are the resources? Yeah, it begs the question, why do we ask for the data if we're not going to use it? And then, unfortunately, and I have one other article that I'll submit for the record, the uh, case of Aurora, Illinois from 2019, uh, a gun that had never should, should never have been a... a purchase of a firearm that should never have happened. And then actually several years later, when he applies for a concealed carry permit, it's discovered, oh my, you shouldn't even have a stupid gun. No one ever picked it up. And then it was used in a, in a workplace shooting, which was tragic. So I'll ask you to consent to insert that in the record as well. Yeah, and that's, okay. that's the reason why I felt so strongly that if we're gonna ask for data, we at least ought to look at it from time to time. And uh, maybe if we looked at it from time to time, We'd, uh, we'd come to grips with the funding issue as well. So thank you for the hearing today, and thanks for allowing me to participate. And I'll yield back. Thank you, uh, Dr. Burgess. Uh, before we close, is there anything that any of the panelists would like to add that you think hasn't been covered or anything that we uh, should bear in mind as we're considering this? Feel free. Uh, one last thing, Chairman and, and Ranking Member. You brought up an excellent point about the data and what happens to it. Uh, fortunately, in the Violence Against Women Act Reauthorization Act that just passed and was signed by the president, there was a provision called NICS denials notification. So when that background check is failed, that data no longer sits at NICS. They are required by law now to send it to state and local law enforcement so that 
Sheriff Baxter and others will get the ping that says individual was denied at this gun store, and now we have to make sure that that's implemented. But I, I think this Congress did an excellent job in a bipartisan manner to actually get that into law. And going forward, that data doesn't just sit in a database. It will go out into the field and can be used effectively to go investigate these in instances of a denial. Uh, and so I just wanted to add that at the end because I think you're raising an excellent point that I agree with. And I'm very, I was very proud to see that, that piece of legislation signed into law. Mr. Napier. Yes, sir. There was earlier testimony about the drop-off in number of ATF visits. It was my observation that in the beginning of 2020, folks were locked down and could not get out, including the ATF. They had to park their government car in their driveway, and they didn't leave. So naturally, the number of inspections would drop off significantly, and that's my take on why those dropped off so much. Dr. Lee, I mean, I'm sorry. If I could just yeah. ask a follow-up to that, are people back on the job now? They are back been in the a, field. It's been a problem across federal agencies that uh, people sort of took the pandemic plus four years off. So I, I hope they're back on the job. Let me put it that way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Dr. Lee? Since we've been talking so much about the federally licensed gun dealers, uh, which is an important source of guns, we also have to recognize that universal background checks really only apply to those gun dealers. So if you buy a gun at a gun show, at a gun auction through a private sale, there is no background check. And so again, then that data are not useful to guns being sold in that manner. Um, and this is why stronger background check laws are important. I appreciate that. I, I, we omitted mentioning that, but obviously it's a, it's a really important. Mr. Uh, Merrill, may I ask a follow-up question? Yeah, sure, Doctor. I guess Mr. Napier is, uh, if a federal firearms dealer sells a gun at a gun show, are they required to go through the process? Yes, sir. They operate just like they do in their licensed facility. And if a gun is purchased online from a federally licensed dealer, are they required to go through the process? They have to follow all the same laws. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and, I, and not to... Uh, be argumentative. I, I think the point was that that is for federally licensed licensees, but there are a lot of people, obviously, at gun shows and private dealers who aren't licensed at all. I think that was the point, Dr. Lee, you were trying to make. Yeah. Um, any other comments? Uh, let me just say this. I'm, I'm really grateful, Dr. Burgess, for uh, his uh, continued uh, support of, uh, of, of being here today and, and uh, always asking great questions. Grateful to my other colleagues. Well, a point of clarification. Them. Support is generous. Support a a the effort to have here. the conversation here. I didn't say support of the bill, oh. just to be clear. Um, although hopefully I'll get you there too. Um, but I am grateful to my colleagues. And I, I do think we should be able to find on this issue common ground and common sense that could guide us and, uh, and, and put us in a better place and really give tools to uh, law enforcement and, and, and end up in a place where we have far less violence, far fewer guns on our streets, uh, and make sure that there's accountability. So with that, again, thank you to all the panelists for uh, not only being here today, but, uh, but everything you do. And with that, this hearing is closed.